guys, it's Eric, owner of Farpoint Farms here in the mountains, North Carolina. And tonight, we will talk about amplifiers. That's right, CB amps. And this also works for ham amps as well. But I'm going to be talking, it's kind of a beginner's guide. This is going to be a long video. Be prepared. You can fast forward through it. We're going to talk about the history of amps. We're going to talk about how amps work. We're going to talk about why they do and do not sound good. And we're going to talk about, uh, well, anything else I can think of. But I would imagine this is probably going to be a good 15, 20 minutes. So buckle up, because here we go. CB amps, right? Why in the heck do these things even exist? The FCC says 4 watts AM, 12 watts SSB. That's the law, right? It's been that way since, well, pretty much the beginning. I, I'm not sure. I don't remember in the 60s if there were any other requirements. But for the most part, let's just say those were the rules. Now, back in the 60s, mm, that was okay. Early 70s, CB really started to take off, and we already started to see overcrowding. We had 23 channels, and there was a lot of people talking to each other. People started to come up with ways to be sure that their voice was heard over everyone else's. The best way to go about doing that, in my opinion, bigger antennas, better grounding, better cable wiring. The better your setup is on those levels, the better the radio is going to sound and be heard, right? And also the signals you pick up are going to be heard better. So that's the, that's the initial way we took it. As the late 70s arrived, we've got tons of people on the radio. So much so the FCC responded to that and actually added channels to the CB band. We went from 23 to 40. Again though, those channels were just overwhelmed. We had towns and municipalities where there was just everybody had one in their car, everybody had one in their house. And at night, it was just insane. Now you add into a solar cycle that's peaking and we have all that skip both day and night. So we have all this interference. We're hearing people from other cities and no one could hear anybody. The guy you were trying to have a conversation with was not the guy you were able to talk to. So again, people looked at other ways to get that signal. They wanted that signal to be over the top of everybody else. And of course, the way to do that after you've perfected your system is to add more wattage. Regardless of whether it was legal or illegal, people started to build their own sets. They started building tube amps, which are beautiful things like this here, or maybe very old and rickety looking things, but they were very unique and they worked like this one here. I've come across a few uh, that I assume were uh, CB amps that were tube amps like that over the years. And, and uh, certainly they're, they're very cool looking. Some of the designs that people came up with were pretty interesting. Uh, so anyway, they, that's how it started, right? Well, if there's a market, there's going to be entrepreneurs. So it wasn't hardly any time. And companies like Palomar, like making this amp right here is an example of a Palomar. And then we had uh, Texas Star. Here's a, a picture of Texas Star right here, or a couple of them actually. And then we had a lot of a lot of independent, smaller ones. Here's a couple of no names, right? We had companies that were using names that they didn't even own. There's Cobra Amps. Well, Cobra never officially made an amp. Galaxy Amps. I don't think Galaxy ever officially made an amp. And then we got our, our custom high-end ones like uh, Dave Maids, right? Those are very nice amps that are, are probably still produced to this day for all I know. So we have all these amps and they came out in the late 70s, early 80s, and, uh, and rolled right through the 80s into the 90s and all the way straight up to today. RM Italy still producing amps right now. But people decided, hey, I'm going to put a little bit of, they called them heat our heaters, uh, they call them foot warmers, they call them amps, linears, kickers, they're all meaning the same thing. CB amp, right? Well, I got an amp hooked to my system, now I can talk. And, and they did. So when we have a well-built CB amplifier hooked to a well-designed radio, hooked to well-grounded equipment with a great quality antenna and great quality cabling, well, you're going to sound awesome and you're definitely going to travel a lot farther with your voice. So this began the next phase of CB antennas and CB, you know, as a hobby, we had the big boys, right? The guys who had uh, maybe beams or quads even running multiple hundreds of watts and they're able to talk wherever they wanted to. Um, maybe not nationwide, but certainly the range was, you know, if you had a, a stack beam you know, that was directional, you could probably get almost 100 miles out of that sucker with the right amount of amperage behind it or wattage behind it. Unfortunately, what happened more often than not is people who didn't know how to set up their radios in the first place, so they had crappy quality coax, they had a crappy antenna that wasn't tuned well, they had a radio that they hadn't had, and I'll get into this in a minute or two, hadn't been tuned down to match that amp, and they were talking like crazy with six, seven, eight hundred watt or more amplifiers, and so these amps were just throwing out garbage. 
but that garbage still interrupts the channels. It messes up the channels, right? It bleeds over. So if I'm throwing 700 garbage watts across of channel 19, I'm also destroying channel 20 and channel 18 and channel 17 and channel 21. And for some guys who happen to be living close to these folks or happen to be nearby when a car is driving by transmitting this trap, it blows out the whole band. I mean, it just kills all 40 channels. You can hear this muffled garbage. So quickly, ham radio operators, normal CB operators, and the FCC got real sick and tired of that. It was destroying. You got harmonics on other bands. I mean, it's, and I'm not going to get into the science behind it, but if you throw a thousand watts and it's bleeding over, it's not, it's not balanced right, it's going everywhere. Heck, it could be on the AM band. I mean, like terrestrial AM radio band. It could be bleeding over, and it often did on TV bands. And so you would key down with this, <laughs> this setup of yours, and every house in the neighborhood heard you cussing up a storm. And that was what the 80s were like. It was pretty interesting to be honest with you it's kind of cool but i mean not cool but just very very different man we didn't have cable tv so it was very unique when you were watching television and all of a sudden somebody starts cursing up a storm over the airwaves <laughs> anyway the fcc gets called in and the crackdown begins and buddy i'll tell you what if then or even now you get caught with the cb amplifier in operation or somebody's calling in complaints because you are interfering with their television or their microwave or whatever, you could get a big old fine and you could get your equipment confiscated. And if you repeat offend, well, I bet you, you probably still go to jail. I know back in the day, there were guys who had beautiful high-end systems that were taken by the FCC because they were, they were a nuisance. And you know what? You kind of deserve it. If you're a nuisance, you, you kind of deserve it. Anyway, that is kind of the history of it. That leads us up to uh, my interaction with CB amps, and I'm going to admit now, this is a disclaimer, I owned an amp for about uh, four years back in the um, late 90s. I would say probably 96, maybe end of 95 through the end of 99, maybe late 98, I had an amp. So my second base station that I ever had, my real base station, was a unit in Washington base, and it came as a package with a mobile amp that was a uh, Palomar 400. And those two had been kind of tuned to each other. It was a cool deal. And I, I did use it occasionally to talk skip. I never used it for local talk because I just didn't need to. But I did use it for talk and skip. I did find it fun. The thing was, it was a mobile amp inside the house. I didn't have a power supply or nor the money to buy one big enough to deal with it. So every time I wanted to use it, I had to go get the battery out of my car. As you can imagine, I didn't use it a whole lot because of that. Again, we'll get into some of those details of how to set one up here in a little bit. Anyway, yeah, I did use one, so I do know how they operate. Um, some of them had manual switches for AM and sideband operation. A lot of them came with a preamp, and almost all of them had an on-off switch. Uh, there were a few that had automatic switching AM, SSB. They had a relay in there that could detect the difference in this carrier signal. So uh, those exist as well. And here's a picture of uh, you know the faceplate of, say, a Palomar that has those three switches. Okay. Okay, so... That is the end of the history lesson. Now I'm going to talk to you about what uh, what to expect out of an amp because this is where most of my questions, people don't care about the history, but people do care about what can it do for me today, right? So a reason you own an amp would be um, I'm living in an area and I have a group of people that I'm wanting to talk with and there's one or two that are just fringe. They're just out there at the very edge. Some nights we can talk and it's okay. I got a minute, like maybe one bar, maybe one and a half and we have a good conversation. But if there's electrical interference, or if the atmosphere is just right, we're no no go there. So you could throw a, a, an amplifier in line with your radio at that point, and uh, that would probably make the difference. But what good is it if the person on the other end doesn't have an amp as well? Because what good is it if he hears you, but you can't hear him, or vice versa, right? So you both have to have amps. So there's a downside to it already. So uh, cost of equipment. You know, these amps, I guess the, K, the KL40 that I was talking about, the little inexpensive one, they call it a stinger board or whatnot. You know, those might be 60 bucks, but you get up into the four to 600 uh, amp range, and you're looking at three or four hundred dollars uh, for use. I don't know what they cost new. Uh, so there's another thing to think about. But here's the deal, right? If I'm going to hook an amp up to this, if I hook up, say, a 200 watt amp to this radio right here, and I just go right to town, right, to start talking, I'm likely to get a lot of people saying, "Hey, man, you're you're kind of like overmodulated. Your your voice is garbled. I can hear you." but it sounds muffled or it sounds weird, it sounds wrong, or maybe they're hearing me one channel over. So what the problem there is, is that these radios are designed to put out 4 watts on AM and 12 watts on SSB.
but the majority of your amps that you're going to find in these stores or online, those are only designed to be driven, that means how much wattage goes into them, with a very small amount of power, say half a watt or one watt. Maybe some of the bigger ones can handle two watts. But when we take one of these out of the box and we plug it in line with this radio and we try to use it stock, you would think it would work, but it doesn't work. It's not the way it works. These need to be detuned in order to work right. So if you've bought a radio here and you bought it online and they said, we got the peak in tune or the magic screwdriver has been taken to it. Well, now instead of four watts, this thing might already be turning out seven or eight watts. Now we're pushing eight watts into a 200 watt amp that's designed to be driven off of half a watt. You would think, well, that means just more power out. No, it means that that amp is not going to last very long. It's likely to just, uh, well, blow up. <laughs> it's going to smoke. Magic smoke's going to come out and it's over with. So uh, things to be aware of right there. So uh, if you're going to try to put an amp in line with a radio, you need to know or have somebody who knows how to detune your radio down to where it's dead key is half a watt to a watt. That will give you a cleaner signal. People will be able to hear you in more power, which is the whole purpose of why you bought the amp in the first place. That being said, so there's your first problem. So many people are just slapping these things on there. They burn them up. If you look on eBay, about 99% of the amps being sold used on eBay are sold for parts or as is. The reason being is most people don't know that. They hook the stuff up and poof, after a couple of hours of talking on it, the finals blew out. And by the way, finals, uh, in this case, we talk about pills. The Toshiba was the most popular, but there were other. They look like little white pills, almost like an aspirin or something like that. And these things would handle the power for a little while, but then they would overheat and fail. So that's, that's what's going on there. Um, gosh, I don't even know where else to go with this, but if you're going to be adding an amp, you're going to have to have your radio modified to accept it. You're going to have to find it. You're going to have to realize that you're operating a, a, a you know, piece of equipment that's illegal and you're opening yourself up to huge fines. Do I personally think it is necessary or needed to run an amp in 2019 and 2020? No, not really, no. There's hardly anyone on the bands. Uh, I mean, you shouldn't have to be talking over anyone. Wait your turn and, and talk. As far as skip, when skip rolls in, it, yeah, I mean, if I, I'm sure if I was running 200 watts or 400 watts, yeah, maybe more people could hear me. But again, what good is it if they're running stock and I can't hear them, right? So I've talked skip all over the world. I've talked to Italy. I've talked, to, I mean, I mean, every nation. And I'm talking on 4 watts or 12 watts SSB. So I really have never found the need to own an amp. Uh, you know, even when I had it, it wasn't something that I went out of my way to get. It was something that was part of a package deal. So those are things to think about. I know I'm going to probably get a lot of hate for this video. Again, I'm not uh, advocating the use of CB amplifiers. I don't, I don't think they're really necessary. I know there's a lot of people out there um, that, that just, you know, that think they need to have many thousands of watts, but it, another problem you're going to run into with these amps is if I don't have a good setup in the first place, if I got my, my tuned up radio from Joey, the uh, magic golden screwdriver guy down on highway whatever, and I've got it hooked to some RG59 cabling that's got, you know, like 4% loss in it, and I've got a 100 foot run going to, uh, you know, an old 102 whip that's not properly grounded, I've got a horrible setup, which is why no one hears me and I can't hear anyone. Now I'm going to throw this four or 600 watt uh, amplifier in line with it and I'm going to blow up the amplifier but in the meantime I'm also going to ruin everything else because no wonder no one can hear me. Even with all that extra wattage, if I don't have a good ground, if I don't have high quality cabling and I don't have a decent antenna, I'm going nowhere. I'm just going nowhere with a bigger engine. You know what I mean? Anyway, that is it. I'm, I don't know what else to say about this. I hope, oh, power. Let me, let me back up. Let me back up. The whole thing about power, this is probably the most important part about it because people think, well, if this is 4 watts and I put 400 watts, well, man, I'm going to be... It's not how it works. Power has uh, as, as doubled, right? So if I have 4 watts and the guy down the street can hear me at one bar and I double my watts to 8 watts, well, most likely, most likely he'll hear me at 2 bars, right? So you think, well, I'll just add another 4 watts and I'll be at 3. That is where things get weird. The doubling of power has to occur each time for an equal increase. So from 8 watts, I need to go to 16. And now if I want a little bit more power, I need to go to 32. And so on and so forth. So by the time we get, and there's a breakaway. Here's a chart that I made. It's a horrible chart, but I tried to do it. I'm not very good at this stuff. You can see this breakaway point right around 400 watts where you want to talk about the amount of amperage it requires to operate this thing. 
or the amount of uh, wattage you need in order to get to that next bar, that next one single little bump in power, it gets astronomical real quick. So from four we go to eight, from eight we go to 1600 watts. The next step up from a 1600 watt amp to make any noticeable difference at all is 3200 watts. That's gonna dim the lights at your house, right? <laughs> and you go from 32 to 6400 watts. There's The radio station in town is only 5000 watts. So, I mean, you're talking about 220 equipment, major power station in order to run this stuff. That being said, there are guys on channels 6 and 11, the Super Bowl channels, that literally run kilowatt-sized stations. And if you think I'm joking, uh, Google it. They're actually out there. And these dudes are running like 440 lines straight from their boxes in their house straight to these amps. These amps are the kind of things that, that look like they belong in a NASA uh, space center. And, uh, and what are they doing with that other than bragging rights? I mean, geez, they're, you know, they're melting down the power lines when they key down on these things, so... That is it. Uh, there's that chart of that, that, that power, that DB power, and, uh, and you can see, I hope that helped out. So anyway, I am Eric, the owner of Farpoint Farms. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, perhaps you will think about liking and subscribing. And I'll see you next time. Take care. There's always something that needs a little fixing on Farpoint Farms. Freedom is mighty sweet, liberty sows its seed at far point.